In an era of profound social change, few industries find themselves at the intersection between law, technology, and social justice the way digital forensics does. This month on the Forensic Focus podcast, our vendor edition welcomes Henrik Tiernberg, chairman of the board of our longtime sponsor, MSAB. Having served in that role since 2002, Mr. Tiernberg has been in the unique position of seeing from a business perspective, how digital forensics has shaped and been shaped by these forces and what it all means for the industry as we enter a new decade. Mr. Tiernberg, welcome. Thank you so much. <laughs> so you've been MSAB's board chairman since 2002. Tell us a little please from your vantage point about the company and its growth over the past two decades. What are some of the most significant milestones? Well, uh, it's been really interesting two de uh, decades here, uh, and a lot of things have happened during that uh, period of time, of course. And a natural starting point, an important one, is, of course, the starting point for, for uh, this kind of business. Because we've been, been uh, working since 1985 and, and started working with mobile phones in the mid-90s when the, the digital DSM was introduced to uh, the market. And, and that meant a lot, of course. It meant that you could start communication with, with your handsets and, and, of course, also connecting to the internet. That was also a new technical feature uh, arriving in the mid-90s. So, so uh, we uh, existed during the dot-com boom, and, and that uh, affected us as uh, many other technological companies. Uh, and after that, uh, in the aftermath, we, we uh, didn't really know what to do. And uh, we had some equipment, we had learned a lot about mobile phones and, and uh, a matter of coincidence, a uh, Swedish policeman turned up uh, at our office uh, and said, I am um, exploring your technology to retrieve evidence from, from these kind of handsets. Of course, that was a rather basic thing because in your handset, you had uh, some uh, telephone book and you had some notes and perhaps missed calls and received calls and, and I didn't think even SMS was beginning to get off as a, a technology to use. So uh, we thought that was interesting so we helped the policeman and that was really the starting point for, for mobile forensic for us and we were then pioneering in this industry no that was not an existing market at that time. Mm -hmm. So uh, a lot of freedom, of course, but a lot of demands from, from our customers, of course, in the beginning, the Swedish police. But we also realized that, uh, for instance, uh, Great Britain has come a bit on that road so far. So we started, in fact, our marketing in, in Great Britain at that time and uh, received an uh, uh, impressive response uh, from, from the police force really interested in this. Uh, they, they used at that time a lot of consultancy, uh, very uh, expensive and such, and, and took some time and realized that the, uh, in fact the product that could do this uh, on demand uh, was something that really hit market. So uh, we started then and we have uh, expanded since then and, and it was a profitable company uh, already 2005, a year after we introduced our first solution. And uh, I also like to mention the second uh, point in time as a, a milestone, I think, and that was the introduction of, of the smartphone. Yes. And when Apple introduced uh, their first iPhone, mm -hmm. uh, something great happened to, uh, in the marketplace because you got the tool you can use for so many things and very uh, a lot of things had to do with communication. You could use it for, for chatting, you could use it for playing, you could use it for uh, uh, accessing data or the internet, uh, a lot of things. And, and uh, of course, the beginning of the social media structure and everything you could do with that. And, and that meant also a, a great change in what we uh, did and what we do today. Because in the beginning, there were a lot of different handsets, a lot of different operating system, a lot of different manufacturers of handsets, you know, the, the basic players were, were Ericsson, Nokia, Siemens, Motorola, uh, and a lot of them doesn't do anything about mobile phones today. Mm -hmm. But when, when Apple arrived and, and this kind of, of new tool got into the hands of the customer, it also got into the hands of, of uh, the criminals, of course. Right. 
uh, and that really to use for, for criminal activity, activities. And, and uh, well, that's often the case when it comes to new technology. They are very uh, fast starting to use it. And uh, the problematic thing is it takes some time for the police to, to um, get up to speed uh, in that arena. And we thought this is an opportunity for us to help the police uh, getting the advantage of the new technology. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But the uh, uh, conclusion is that uh, everything is happening and new things all the time. You need to be aware of it and, and act on, upon the new information and what is happening. Uh, and it's moving fast. Mm -hmm. yep. So you're, uh, you mentioned uh, that, that the police use of the tools have been uh, a really a key part of the, the growth mm -hmm. of the company um, mm -hmm. since, since its inception, really. Um, it, yeah. so in, in those two decades, how have some of the trends just um, geopolitically and, and also socially generally shaped MSAB's vision, direction, and strategy? Well, uh, yes, of course, uh, many things happen uh, during this period, you know, uh, the starting point was, of course, the war on terror or terrorism uh, started with the 9-11 event, an awful thing that happened and, and shook, I think, most of the population around the globe uh, and, and it started a, a hunt for terrorists. And of course, we had the bombings in, in uh, the London subway and even in Spain uh, later on. And, and that started a movement uh, for uh, preventing and, and uh, hunting terrorists. And that, that was a key part in uh, what we did, of course, with uh, thought and, and, and the demand for, for new products, new solutions that could help the police in this uh, strive uh, was really important. And, and we were uh, early to adopt for this and, and uh, of course also uh, starting a, a mission where it said that it's important, not, I, I think we will come back to that, but, but the, the demand for mass surveillance started to grow and I thought that was uh, not a, a good way to deal with this because it's better to focus on those that really are suspect for this. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Often it is uh, in this kind of terror arrest event that I mentioned, you can see that afterwards uh, the police say that, well, uh, we had these up on our raid, uh, radars. We, could, uh, we had, uh, had surveillance of these individuals, mm -hmm. but we didn't have the resources to continue that. Mm -hmm. So uh, when we stopped doing that, we uh, also let them uh, commit these kind of crimes. And, and that, uh, I believe it's important that you focus on what can uh, solve crimes and what can prevent crimes. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think that's a lesson even the law enforcement have learned during these years. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You wrote a blog post recently in response to a New York Times article about MSAB selling into Myanmar. Uh, so your blog post reflected that MSAB chose to withdraw our services to regimes that have turned their backs on democracy. What are some other examples of times when MSAB had to choose justice over profits? Well, uh, that's, of course, uh, a question that we have to handle all the time, I would say. And, and the natural uh, times and, and part we, we can mention, of course, is China and Hong Kong, which we choose to withdraw from uh, a year ago or more. Uh, and, and, of course, we do uh, this kind of, of uh, difficult decisions all the time. Uh, that's a, uh, we cannot, uh, so to say, put that on paper and, and be uh, happy with it because uh, things are changing all over time. And, and we need to make these kind of decisions uh, even every day, so quite often, uh, I would say. Mm -hmm. uh, and and uh, that's, an, an, uh, of course, a uh, discussion and then the judgment, and we need uh, a lot of things to, to make those. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But, but uh, I say, um, as a general rule, uh, and I, I think it's important for, for our business as well, that we, uh, we choose uh, the right thing to do, 
before uh, profit. And, and I think it will uh, be profitable over time. That's uh, important because they work together. I, in short term, it could be a, a, a economic loss for the company, but in long term, it could be a, a profit. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, so it's uh, not so that we choose between profit and, and uh, mm. uh, just uh, thing to do. It's, it's uh, how we think about it and, and uh, we think it's a good time. It's, uh, uh, we are in the business of trust. Mm -hmm. And uh, everyone, our customers, uh, public opinion, and everyone uh, should trust that we do the right thing. That's important. To that point and your earlier points about terrorism and surveillance, it does seem mm -hmm. as if much of the world is in flux with privacy and security intention mm -hmm. globally. Um, so the lines may not always be as clear as in Myanmar. How can corporate leadership keep track and pivot when needed in response to these subtler shifts in political winds? Well, uh, it's, it's really difficult, uh, I would say, because this is not black or white. Uh, it's a, a gray scale and uh, things change over time. So a lot of things, uh, I, I think you should start with the standpoint. What are your long term goals? And for us, it's important to be the good guys, uh, do what's right, uh, have this moral compass. Uh, we believe in human rights, we believe in, in freedom of speech, freedom of expression, uh, and everything around that. Uh, it's important we believe in democracy and building that. Uh, then we need to uh, gather information, uh, as much information we can uh, around the situation in the target uh, region or, or the target, target customer. And, and we do that by, by looking at uh, those who are, are uh, professional in these areas. And, and uh, we have looked at Freedom, Freedom House. We have looked at Human, Human Rights Watch and Amnesty International. We are also uh, a, a really knowledgeable person in, in the board of directors, uh, former foreign minister in Sweden, former prime minister in Sweden, uh, Mr. Carl Bildt that has an extensive knowledge of international business and what is happening in different regions. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And uh, as uh, also a, a security check, we also are under um, oversight of the Swedish Export Control uh, Authority mm -hmm. that's called the ESP. And of course, we need uh, export licenses and such from them. And, and those are also professionals in, in doing this kind of judgment. So, so uh, uh, with that said, uh, also we can't uh, give a guarantee that we all always make the right decision, but we are always ready and we have uh, processes for uh, correcting any mistakes you make mm -hmm. and doing that quickly. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So to that point, your tenure began the year following the U.S. Enron scandal. Uh, just last year, the World Economic Forum promoted stakeholder versus shareholder capitalism. In your view, how can corporate leaders maintain their sense of balance between good ethics and good business so as to avoid missteps? Yes, uh, that's uh, uh, also an interesting and, and uh, quite a difficult uh, question. I know. Uh, Milton Friedman once said that the, the business of business is business. Mm -hmm. And I don't totally agree with that because I, I think uh, the business of business is the right business and doing the right thing. And uh, I believe that will uh, uh, be uh, good both for, for shareholders and other stakeholders in this business. But you need a uh, moral compass, you need a uh, uh, DNA, as we call it, that's uh, being doing the right thing, mm -hmm. selling to the right people, selling to the right organizations. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, and because, of course, uh, it can happen that our equipment can be used in the wrong way. And then we have, um, take precautions uh, to prohibit that. Of course, we have a, every kind of document uh, in place for it, but we also need this uh, kind of gut feeling for what is right and what is wrong. And we try to build that into our company culture. Mm 
Uh, so everyone, every uh, co-worker in, in the MSAB uh, knows what is the right thing to do and what is not. Of course, this is a continuous process. Uh, and, and also, uh, it's good for our business because it makes it easiest, easier for us to, to recruit new people. Mm -hmm. They like this idea of doing the right thing. And I, I um, I'm getting, uh, I, I became 60 last year. So I've been around for a while and, and of course with the MSAB, but when I studied at the Royal Institute of Technology in Stockholm, I remember that the two things that was interesting at that point for students, that was the salary and of course the brand name of the company. So mm -hmm. Ericsson in Sweden and ABB and, and IKEA of course, was interesting uh, companies to work for. But today, I think it's moved in the right direction. Mm -hmm. Those you are recruiting, they are interested in, in, do we have a moral compass? Do we have a standpoint, an ethical standpoint in what we do? Mm -hmm. and, and they are asking these questions. So of course, salary is important, but it's also important to, uh, what you should work all the working week should be a good thing. And that uh, to feel good, you can go to sleep knowing you have done a good job both for humanity as a whole and for the company. So I believe uh, it works together. And in these kind of times, there are a lot of, of uh, uh, acronyms uh, flowing around uh, around companies. You have uh, for a couple of years ago, it was CSR, Corporate Social Responsibility. Yes. Uh, today, I think it's ESG, uh, it's environmental, social, and governance. Mm -hmm. And of course, uh, ETI, Ethical Trading Initiative, and such things. And, and those are important, but the most important thing of all is what you actually do. Mm -hmm. Having uh, adopted these kind of, of, of uh, acronyms doesn't help anything unless you in, uh, use them and integrate them into your work. So that's the important thing, and that's what we are doing uh, at MSAB. As an example, in your blog post, you also wrote, we work to prevent mass surveillance when, wherever it is introduced. Can you tell us a little more about those efforts? How is MSAB uniquely positioned to prevent mass surveillance? Yes. Uh, of course, uh, I, I think I mentioned a little about that earlier, but but the police uh, can use two different directions uh, trying to solve crimes. You can uh, believe that all uh, the citizens are suspect, and that leads to more surveillance, and that lead, uh, leads to a huge amount of data, and it leads to uh, a step from uh, democracy, I believe. Or you can use equipment that's targeted at really suspect. Mm. And uh, that's what our equi uh, equipment does. It makes it possible for the police that focus on the evidence that the suspect uh, have in their phones. So uh, that's the important thing. And, and um, I usually uh, take up an, an example from, from Sweden. Uh, of course, you're often proud of being uh, one of the leading democracy, human uh, power uh, state and, and doing everything by the book and, and uh, everyone should look up to us. But uh, if you uh, look closely uh, in uh, the beginning of, after these all the terror events and everything, uh, the EU uh, enforced a directive called the Data Retention Directive that forced every operator uh, uh, active in, in uh, Europe or EU uh, were, uh, had to, by law, uh, store information of every call made, every access to the internet, mm. every SMS sent and received, and where uh, the position uh, was for those. After uh, a special case in the uh, Supreme Court of EU, uh, that directive was redrawn. It was against mm -hmm. human rights. It mm -hmm. was against the privacy you have the right to have uh, a privacy of, of your conversations and what you do. So that was redrawn and, and many countries in the EU uh, took away that kind of legislation. Sweden didn't. So we uh, uh, that came up a new case from Sweden and, uh, and uh, the Swedish law had to be removed. 
Mm. And after a while, Sweden uh, put up a new legislation of, around this, and the legislation uh, contained the same qualities as the first one. So today, all the operators in Sweden need to store information when all the grandmother, uh, Anna, uh, needs to talk to her granddaughter, mm -hmm. you know. And, and of course, uh, all the criminals, they know how to bypass this because they use uh, okay. encrypted chats and they use everything else, but not the thing that the operators are storing. So mm -hmm. that's uh, important because a lot of resources, the cost for doing this kind of, of uh, mass surveillance that uh, the government does is enormous. And it doesn't give any new information. It doesn't give any important information. But what it does is uh, it removes freedom. It removes human rights from the Sweden citizens. And even NSA uh, realized uh, a couple of years ago that, that doing this kind of mass surveillance is uh, removing the focus from those who are suspects. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, so it's uh, a combination of having focus of where uh, the law enforcement should have the focus of those who are really the criminals and those who are committing crimes, not having focus of those who are innocent, will be innocent and will never do any crimes. Mm -hmm. So uh, that's my point here, that, that mass surveillance costs a lot and give nothing but uh, reducing freedom from ordinary citizens. And, mm -hmm. I, I sometimes I'm, I'm use uh, the quote from Benjamin Franklin saying that you, you cannot trade freedom yes. from security. Uh, you know the, what I'm uh, aiming at there. So, so and I think that's important. You cannot, of the discussion is, uh, well, you can, if you have nothing to hide, you have nothing to be afraid of. And that, uh, that's why it doesn't matter if the, the government looks at what you do all the time. But I think it's a dangerous thing to do because that is a step away from democracy, the freedom of speech, freedom of expression, even though uh, if, if you don't think so, it means that you have in your mind that somebody else might, might uh, read what I am writing or might see me or might listen to what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. And that's a restriction uh, you shouldn't have in a, in a democracy. Well, because it, it the, the definitions of, of uh, what counts as criminal behavior can really change, can't they? Yes, yes. And, and of course, you, in a democracy, you don't know if it's a good government or, or right. so. And, and looking at the United States, of course, you have this uh, power or dividing power. You have uh, those who are ex, uh, executives and, mm -hmm. and those who are... are uh, creating laws or, or legislation and, and those who are, who are the judging system and, and they should be uh, autonomous, they should be uh, doing their job different uh, from the, uh, the other parts and then they keep who is guarding the guards, how to speak, someone is, is guarding the other part. Mm -hmm. So uh, that's the way uh, I think it's from the Montesquieu regime how you should look at that but but uh, in Sweden, we don't have that. Mm. We don't have uh, a court looking at if new legislation is uh, uh, okay with the mm. constitution. Mm -hmm. None, no, and, and we have the belief that government is always good. But uh, even in, in Germany, uh, during the Nazi time, the government was chosen by democracy means. Right. Right. So, so you need to build in security system in this kind of uh, democracy system. And that means you cannot allow the government to get uh, these kind of tools mm -hmm. to survey their uh, citizens. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That's important. Yeah. I'm going to switch gears a little bit. <clears throat> um, mm -hmm. In your opinion, how is media coverage on both mobile forensics capabilities and geopolitical trends shaping the digital forensics industry? Well, uh, of course, uh, media is a special business because they are, are uh, they wanting to tell a story and often they have decided what the story is before they uh, gather facts for their story. And, and that's a, a problem you need to deal with. Uh, I would like them to gather facts and then write the story based on the facts. Mm -hmm. But I, I, I learned that uh, it's difficult to change their uh, approach 
during uh, when they they already decided what to write. What to, uh, and I I think it's a lot of kind of misunderstanding. Uh, for instance, in, in Myanmar, uh, the last uh, couple of, of weeks, we saw that uh, there were uh, some discussion around surveillance and what we in fact do. Mm -hmm. And I, I think it's a really great, we cannot do surveillance. And we, we uh, developed our systems not to do surveillance. We can right. look into, uh, like you look at the fingerprint, you don't get it uh, in real time. You mm -hmm. look at it afterwards mm -hmm. uh, to be able to investigate the crime. And I think that's so important that police need to uh, be able to invest crimes and get the suspect and get proof of uh, uh, suspicion uh, to, to stand up in court. And we have this system in place. Mm -hmm. uh, listen, listening to people that may, might be innocent that's not the way to move forward. And, and with these news media, they uh, get uh, hung up on, on the, the, we are listening to people. We are, our mm. equipment can be used to, to crack down a big uh, population or, or human rights movement or, or such. And that's not the case. Mm -hmm. uh, the case is that our equipment can be used for, for uh, Retrieving information and evidence from some single piece of, of evidence as a handset or, or a mobile device, but uh, and and uh, I would like, of course, media to be more proactive and and uh, uh, how should I put it? They should uh, also see the good things we are mm. doing. Mm -hmm. How how this can be used in the greater good for for just keeping democracy alive and helping democracy to grow on those in those areas where it's starting. I, I mentioned earlier uh, the Arab uh, Spring mm. uh, in the 2010. And uh, we thought that as a, a democracy movement, we thought uh, that this is a starting point of, of uh, at least in, in the Middle East and, and the areas around that they should move in, in democracy. and. And we uh, like to help them because building democracy is not done overnight. Mm -hmm. It takes some time. Right. It takes the time to build these kind of institutions, as uh, I mentioned, law enforcement and, and judgment systems and, and rule of law and, and um, everything around democracy to keep it stable. It, it's a rare thing and, and it's fragile to keep, but uh, that didn't, in, in uh, the Arab Spring, it didn't turn out well. We have still living with the, the conflict in Syria. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, so uh, that means we really need to think how to support the starting point for democracy. We cannot wait until it's, it's uh, up and running because that takes some time and we need to help them and support them during that. And, and I believe, uh, hardly believe, that uh, preventing crime and, and making it possible to, to uh, stop child abuse, uh, violence, uh, drug affairs, everything around that, mm -hmm. is really important, even building democracy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. In this landscape, um, including the narrative that media is driving, how do you think the industry as a whole is doing at responding, both in terms of public image and in terms of customer satisfaction, including um, some of those factors that you just mentioned? Where could we all improve? Well, we can improve a lot, uh, I would say. We can stand up for what we believe in. We can stand up for what we do. We are. We have a tendency of, of hiding and, and mm -hmm. just uh, trying to avoid any media uh, mm -hmm. uh, coverage of what we do. And, and I can understand it from, from uh, the law enforcement point of view that they want to not to reveal what, yeah. what they are using, how they are uh, uh, investiga investigating crime and such. But, but that's, of course, uh, some uh, judgment you need to make. Uh, it's important uh, for uh, for the public opinion to uh, gaining trust in the police, and and uh, we can see, for instance, an example of that in in, in London Metropolitan Police, which is one of our uh, good customers. How they gained uh, trust from the public uh, by using 
our tools uh, in connection with uh, when they reported crimes. Mm -hmm. And you get the feeling that the, uh, the police are acting when, when uh, crimes are reported. And that's important. You shouldn't just make a note in a notebook and saying, ah, we we'll see if you have time for this in a later stage. You should be ready to retrieve evidence, retrieve information, making the start point of an investigation. Mm -hmm. Then you're gaining trust from the public opinion. And that's an important thing. And, and uh, I really think both the industry and the law enforcement can help improving that picture from, uh, I think the public picture is, is very much that uh, we, we have a, a crime uh, solving rate in Sweden below 10% today. Mm. That's uh, nine out of 10 crimes are never solved by the police. Mm -hmm. And that's of course not gaining any trust from, from uh, the public. And, and then uh, the things start as uh, gated communities and you, you uh, start to getting uh, not a, uh, a nice society, I would say. It's, it's a depraved society that's hiding and, and don't think that police uh, can really do their work. And, mm. And then the, the demand for uh, harder punishments arises, and more policemen arises. But that's not the, the important question. The important question is doing an efficiency work, uh, making the policemen work more efficient, mm. making solving more crimes and doing that in a faster, quicker way, but maintaining uh, uh, the quality of evidence, the, the, demand for just uh, system that you need to take all the evidence into account. But I think our equipment uh, helps doing exactly mm -hmm. that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, Mr. Tjernberg, thank you again for joining us on the Forensic Focus podcast. We appreciate your time. Thank you so much. It was nice to be here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, I think you raised some really important uh, points for everyone to ponder. So yeah. thank you for that. Thank you so much. Thanks also to our listeners. You'll be able to find this recording and transcription along with more articles, information, and forums at www.forensicfocus.com. If there are any topics you would like us to cover or you would like to suggest someone for us to interview, please let us know.